everyone, and welcome to this next edition of the Sustainable Connections podcast. I'm Mark Lee, the director of the Sustainability Institute at ERM, and really delighted to be your host. If you've listened in before, you know what this is about, but if you're a new listener, the Sustainable Connections concept is that we bring together people working in the sustainability field, especially as relates to business and the role of the private sector, and explore the ways in which folks are collaborating, partnering, and sharing learning to solve collectively these biggest sustainability challenges that we all face, with the idea being that most of them are so big and so tasking of us that we really need to work with others in order to overcome them. Today, I'll be exploring concepts around nature and biodiversity with two folks. And I'm really, really happy to have with me Julie Morad from Salesforce and also Caitlin Brown, who's a colleague of mine at ERM. Julie leads Salesforce's nature positive strategy, which means she's focused on ensuring that the company delivers on its commitment to a nature positive future. And it's really closely related to their climate action. She's part of the nature and international sustainability team at Salesforce. And that means broadly, her work focuses on halting and reversing nature loss by reducing Salesforce's nature impacts, leading restoration at scale, and accelerating customer success and the global nature positive movement. We're gonna get into all that and explain a bit more about what all those words and commitments mean as we move forward, but also to give you a bit of background on Caitlin. She's a managing consultant inside ERM's corporate sustainability and climate change team. She started her career in the retail area of industry, helping to develop sustainability strategies across climate action, food waste, the circular economy, community impact and biodiversity. Since being at ERM, she's really thrown herself into this nature and biodiversity work and really helped shape our new nature service line. Uh, she works with corporations globally to understand what nature means to their business and how this can contribute to their long-term business resilience. So two fantastic folks to explore this topic that is still pretty new to many of us, I think, especially in a corporate setting. So Julie and Caitlin, that's the bios. You know, anybody can read these and they can find more about you online. But I'd like each of you to add a little bit to my introduction of the two of you. I'd love to know how you ended up in nature-focused roles at a point when nature-focused roles are just starting to appear and the nature and biodiversity field is kind of only just coalescing. And then you're both working on nature. You both still have climate in your title. And there's a really close relationship between these things. And I wonder if you can explain a little bit why. And Julie, can you open that up? Happy to. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, it's great to have this conversation with you both. So how did I get here? <laughs> it's a great question. Sometimes I ask myself that. I feel very lucky to have been at Salesforce for the past seven years and have done a variety of roles within the climate space and ESG reporting side. And Salesforce is a company that has been investing in sustainability for a number of years. So we've had full sustainability program, but what we didn't have was a defined nature program. And so I feel very lucky that I've been part of the team at this time. I feel like it's just great timing. Um, I've had this ESG background, as I said, and helped develop Salesforce's ESG strategy and helped incubate that program within the company. And so I'm able to bring that skill set to nature, which we know is a really um, hot topic right now, is a topic that's gaining a lot of traction, is a topic that's going to be seeing our boardrooms, if not now, then very shortly. And so taking that knowledge of how do you build a strategy around a big concept like climate or ESG and applying that to nature is how I found myself here. But I think the personal side of that is just really fascinating. Um, it's really exciting to every day get to learn about something that is so present around us and is something that really lights up conversations with people. I think people get very excited about nature, whether it's because they love being outdoors, whether it's because they have some familial connection to land. Um, there's really an inroad with anyone you meet, which I think makes it a joy to work on. That's really interesting. I do see that difference in the conversations I have with people about the climate versus nature elements of my work. And climate, for all we do know and understand about its pressures, can still seem abstract and remote, and individuals don't quite know how it connects to them, whereas nature is present somehow for all of us. I guess, Caitlin, that's 
a decent pass to you. How and why is nature present for you? How'd you end up doing this work as well? Thanks for the introduction, Mark, and great to be here. My core focus at work and personal life has always been moving towards nature. I spend a lot of time growing up in the garden with my mum, who's massively keen on getting children outdoors and excited about the space around them. And when I went to university to study geography, I always imagined after that I'd have to don the dungarees, get really involved in conservation, heavy work, put on some welly boots and get physically active. And actually, since finding myself within ERM, I've just been completely in the right place at the right time, where the whole agenda of biodiversity, nature, once used to be a buzzword, I think even up until the end of 2022, particularly in corporate and financial industries, it was a buzzword that didn't really mean a lot, wasn't really grounded in regulation, policy, there wasn't a lot of understanding at the C-suite level. And all of a sudden, in the last 18 months, there's been a significant shift with the global biodiversity framework being launched at the end of last year. A lot of the pieces of the puzzle are actually coming into place at a really, really impressive rate. And a lot more action is expected. And I've thrown myself at that. I want to be at the heart of it. I care deeply passionately about having access to nature in our personal lives. But I also have that awareness, which a lot of my colleagues at ERM do, many of whom have got doctorates, PhDs in conservation, ecology science. We have that understanding that we already interact with nature every single day, whether that's through our pension investments, purchasing decisions, the air that we're breathing, we're already relying on it and businesses are relying on it too. The risk is there and I really want to be at the heart of helping business manage that risk, not only for their own benefit, but for the benefit of society. Julie, I want to hear why Salesforce is doing this work. I mean, I know the company reasonably as an outsider and I do admire it as a sustainability leader. And it seems you're extending that leadership now as one of the early companies digging into the nature and biodiversity agenda, maybe especially in technology, where the footprints and the direct impacts just aren't so big. So why? You know, why is the company leading into the nature agenda the way that it is? How do you decide maybe what benefits does Salesforce hope to derive from doing this work? Great question. So I think why Salesforce, why a technology company? It's something I hear a lot. Salesforce has been on our sustainability journey, as you alluded to, for over a decade. We've had a number of programs that have supported nature, either embedded within other programs that we run or a bit more explicitly. So have many investments in nature-based solutions as part of our commitment to net zero. We've helped stand up 1T.org in partnership with the World Economic Forum, so focusing on forest ecosystems and the importance of them, um, both from a biodiversity perspective as well as from a carbon sequestration point of view. We have an ocean sustainability program. So we had all these pockets of programs, but they weren't brought under one umbrella. So that was where our nature team was formed. And I think the reason why it's recognized as something that needs a dedicated team, that needs a dedicated strategy and action plan behind it is because, yes, we have the climate crisis and we also have this biodiversity crisis on our hands. And the two are reinforcing one another negatively at this point in time, but have the power to positively reinforce one another. If we can have intact carbon sinks that are are healthy forests, healthy oceans, that will help us address the climate crisis. If we can prevent some of the worst effects of climate change, we can make sure that that nature stays intact. And so we see it being integral to society around us and also integral that a company needs to be making strategic decisions based off of a very strong understanding of its risks, opportunities, impacts, and dependencies. So really, you know, as as a technology company, but more so as a company that is here to help other companies, other organizations think about what does connecting with their customer base look like? What does it mean to be a business of the future? Integrating nature into that is a no-brainer. If you fail to do that, you're failing to create a business that is, is fit for the future. So I think in terms of benefits we hope to gain from that, there are, of course, the climate benefits that I mentioned, like carbon sequestration, 
but I think nature also allows us its opportunities to support biodiversity, of course, but also to support people and livelihoods that are dependent upon nature. For listeners who might not know 1T.org, it's the uh, One Trillion Trees movement. And if you go to 1T.org, you'll find information about what that all means. And Salesforce has been a big backer. And, and Julie, just want to stick with you on this interconnection, again, climate and nature. And I'm sure the answer is going to be both. So I need you to help me unpick it a little bit. But many organizations and people have been working longer on climate than on nature and biodiversity. And I think it's it's definitely the more embedded in corporate strategies today. I think there's this growing realization that that climate can't be solved without protecting biodiversity. So is is either one more dependent on the other to to deliver results? Are we actually going to flip this around so that it's biodiversity first, climate second? What I hear from folks is we haven't prioritized nature and biodiversity alongside climate in the way that we should. We haven't valued nature as we should. There's a lot of momentum in that direction. What a great time to be in the sustainability field and to be thinking about these two issues together. And I think a lot of professionals at this point in time are saying, whether that's coming from sustainability departments or other parts of organizations, whether that's finance or procurement, you know, sometimes you're hearing, ah, another topic to consider and integrate and manage, that's too much. We're just getting our hands around climate. You know, let's solve that first and we'll come back to nature. Um, you're seeing at the government level as well, which is very concerning. We can't afford to put pause on nature. It needs to be integrated now. And as a sustainability professional, I think that's quite exciting because we've already figured out how to integrate a massive topic like climate into our business decisions, which has helped pave the way for also thinking about how do we integrate nature in the same way. And so I think very practically what I'm seeing is, you know, we already have those relationships with our finance organization. We already have those relationships with procurement. We already have the relationships with legal and the legalese language that we need to insert into contracts with our suppliers. There's some very now low hanging fruit because of all of that hard work we've put in to address climate within our corporate environments that I think what a great on ramp for nature and we just need to need to seize this moment. Caitlin, you're you're part in a way of of um, the Salesforce story. You've been a partner in their work helping coordinate ERM's inputs and insights to that. But you're also working with a range of other companies on the agenda. And so we've heard Julie describe kind of their jumping off point. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about maybe other companies that are early leaders. And especially, I think there's more companies thinking through what to do and when to start than those who've already begun. What do you say about the need to act now and maybe first steps? One of the first things to actually reflect on is any company who is starting now is a leader in their own right. Not many companies are addressing all the various components required to actually be a leader across engaging their stakeholders across their value chain, working with their suppliers, ensuring that they know every single location in their value chain that is in a deforestation risk location. All of those components are critical to actually become a leader, but we're not really seeing a lot of businesses move fully into that space now. There's, there's a big recognition it's a journey and a lot of companies are just getting started, but a lot of companies are not doing anything at all. So if you are a company that is starting to look at where do you interact with nature, who are the suppliers that might be exposed to nature related risks from flooding, drought, wildfires, then that's a really significant first step. So when we're talking about leadership, it looks very, very different depending on the nature of the company and what your core business activities are and who your stakeholders are and the regulatory environment that you're interacting with. And I think that's absolutely OK. And one of the critical things that we, particularly within ERM, are encouraging any company to be comfortable with is to know that we don't we don't fully know what that end journey looks like yet. So that leadership position is a little bit uncertain. But companies that are getting started now are in a really strong place to drive towards that. Within ERM, we have looked at what does best practice mean for businesses. And actually, we're finding that the safest place to go to is actually a lot of the core frameworks 
and coalition recommendations as to what does best practice mean. And over time, add on the building blocks to gradually put themselves into that leadership position. So the frameworks are one of the ways to navigate this. Uh, Julia, I want to come back to you because part of your navigation, maybe it's the rudder at Salesforce, is the concept of nature positive. And I think you mentioned that briefly in your opening comments, but like 1T.org, it may have gone past a lot of folks or may have had them shake their head a little bit to say, what does nature positive mean? How do I get there? So can you define it from your own perspective and for the company, if that makes sense? But then tell us a little bit about what kind of collaboration is going to be needed to achieve nature positive. Yes. So nature positive, the new new kid on the block, new term on the block for <laughs> sustainability professionals. In short, nature positive means halting and reversing nature loss. We are on a fast moving downward trajectory where we are depleting nature and it's getting, it is out of hand and we need to bend that curve so that we stop destroying nature essentially to a place where it won't be able to recover from and start regenerating nature so that we can continue to benefit from the various services that nature provides us like we've alluded to a few times in this conversation. At Salesforce, we'll be, we've published a nature positive strategy, which is our set of actions around how we will halt and reverse nature loss and is very much integrated with our climate action plan. But we are not saying that Salesforce is nature positive. We're saying that our actions are contributing towards this nature positive future. So a future where there is more regeneration rather than nature loss. So why, why that distinction? We think it's really important because there's no way right now for any company to say, we have achieved nature positive, right? Mm -hmm. That future is very much a collective goal that we're all striving for. And I think when we sometimes say, okay, here's what a corporate can do and have the ability to tick the box, that really limits our ways of thinking and ways that we form what actions we're going to take as companies, right? So I think it, it limits us. It makes it seem like here's what I'm responsible and I'm only going to do that, right? And this is not a moment where we can afford for that siloed thinking. This is a moment where we need to have collaboration. And you asked, what does collaboration look like? I think it's going to take all sorts of shapes and forms. Um, but from a company point of view, we know that collaboration will, for us at Salesforce, look like engagement with our upstream value chain. So with our suppliers, which is where our nature impacts lie in our value chain. How do we work with them? How do we encourage them to set their own targets? How do we encourage them to reduce their own impacts and dependencies and risks related to nature? And also downstream, if you think about Salesforce as a technology company, we work with almost every single sector in many different geographies, What? how are we empowering our customers to contribute towards this nature positive future? You know, For us, we offer technology and tools that re revolve around data and relationships. There's a very important role that data is gonna, data and data management is going to play in this nature positive transition. I think finally beyond upstream downstream, there's a whole set of systems that we're all part of that absolutely need to shift. Advocacy is incredibly important to ensure that private sector action is complemented by a regulatory environment that essentially um, creates a positive feedback loop that incentivizes change that we need. So I really like the distinction that it's not about Salesforce being nature positive, at least not on its own, but rather contributing to a larger environment in which nature positive is possible. And you strayed already into value chain and the fact that it depends on working with your partners. I just wonder with, with all the complexity of value chains, how folks are responding and what some of the early efforts to do this with your business partners look like. There's gonna be a number of different players and these players need to be thinking about a lot of different moving pieces. And I think to some, that would be very overwhelming. I think to most sustainability professionals, that's why we're part of this field and it's exciting. Um, and it's it's part of you know the learning process and what makes us excited to go back to work the next day is 
the potential for that ripple effect that we can have um, that I don't think is true of every position and nature really affords us the opportunity to and, and forces us to think of things through that lens of the interconnections between bits and pieces. And you mentioned TNFD and the assessment work that we did with you. And Caitlin, I'd love to bring some of this to you. Um, that there's, If I torture recent movies, there's something about climate that is everything everywhere all at once, right? It, it doesn't matter where things are emitted. It's a global problem, one atmosphere. And that leads to that almost agency problem where it's a bit of a struggle to know what to do sometimes from any one place. With nature, it's every location at each moment, also all at once, but also unique to that place. You know, location becomes differently essential to this conversation because global water strategies don't mean much unless you get to places of water crisis. Um, Julie mentioned TNFD, and there's something connected to TNFD called LEAP that gets into this notion of location. And I think it'd be useful if you could tell our listeners a little bit more about the task force on nature-related financial disclosures and about the LEAP framework. Absolutely. And I think it also ties um, quite neatly into that point on collaboration. So the TNFD itself is a highly collaborative forum, which has been developed to understand what are the global market needs to actually start understanding nature related risks? So when we're thinking through collaboration, yes, it's critical across supply chains and the local stakeholders, but it's also at the industry wide. And we should all be looking to learn from other industries, collaborate together. We're all pioneers trying to understand what is the next critical step that we need to be taking. And the TNFD itself, in terms of what it is, it is over 800 organizations that are currently invested in piloting, trialing and learning from it. It's modeled on the task force for climate related disclosure. So again, that reflects back to one of the previous conversations around the synergies between climate and nature. There's a really strong understanding that the two are intrinsically linked and we need to try and cut down the silos that we've historically been addressing various sustainability issues with to really drive forward that collaboration across all the different components. And the TNFD itself, its, its main objective is to support a shift in global financial flows away from nature negative outcomes towards nature positive outcomes. And there's that whole debate around, as we had earlier, what does nature positive even mean? But for now, it's semantically helpful to just say nature positive in the way that we're not only reducing the negative impact, but moving towards a stewardship approach and accelerating positive impact, not just for your business, but for wider stakeholders. Because we all have that, that, uh, that risk exposure and it's too risky to rely on someone else to do enough. So the TNFD itself, in order to help corporates actually start understanding what are their nature related risks, has developed a very practical, often like very, very flexible um, and quite complex approach to assessing nature related risks across your value chain. But stripping back a lot of the complexity with new terms, new acronyms, what does impact and dependency mean? At its heart, it is actually relatively simple and it all starts with locate. And one of the first steps that any corporate has to do, any financial institution, if they want to understand what their nature risks are, is locate where they are already operating. So if you're operating in different countries within your core operations and you have thousands of suppliers, ultimately, yes, you need to locate every single one of them. But for now, just start with your direct operations. That's where you've got business buy-in, you've got stakeholders you can engage with. And actually, you probably already got a lot of data on water, waste, pollution, greenhouse gas emissions. Location is absolutely critical. And it's not as hard as it might first seem. A lot of that data does already exist. And then moving beyond the piece of locate within the TNFD leap framework is all around evaluating and assessing what are the impacts that any business, whether it's extracting water from a high water stress area, whether it's releasing contaminants into local water streams, what are the impacts that the business operations are actually having on the ecosystems? And how dependent is the business as well 
on the free ecosystem services that we've historically been relying on. And all of that understanding requires time. It requires engaging with individuals who interact within water basins, who interact at the landscape level. But it's about focusing on the areas where, again, you've got that control and you've got a lot of data and you've got the ability to engage with those stakeholders. So with all of this, it's starting small, starting manageable, and then over time being prepared to learn and get bigger over years. It doesn't need to all happen now. And then the fourth bit of the LEAP approach is around preparing, preparing for disclosure. And ultimately that sends a market signal that you are addressing, understanding, and looking to manage any nature related risk across your value chain. And LEAP itself is just one of many different frameworks. However, it is the one that we're seeing a lot of corporates particularly lean on because it does give a lot of flexibility. And what that means is dependent on where you are, how much time and money and business case buy-in for nature there is right now, you can just get started and then over time reveal the risks and then start to invest more time to actually start managing them. Julie, you've been through some of this and we should stress TNFD isn't even final in the world yet. So many folks will probably know this, but the the, the first full iteration of, of TNFD is expected to be released this September. We're currently working with the, the last beta draft, if you will, that was put out in March. And we do expect the final version of TNFD to look very much like that last draft. But Julie, if we work from TNFD doing at least two things, kind of offering a recommended approach to how to assess nature dependencies and offering some disclosure guidance, can you tell us how you've used TNFD to inform what Salesforce has done, uh, even as it's been going through its own draft stages? We did an assessment using the LEAP framework, um, and that was helpful to us in terms of giving us a baseline of understanding. And I think what Caitlin said responds to your question about nature positive being moving us more towards a stewardship approach is really interesting and right. At minimum, by aligning with the TNFD framework, companies are getting great data points, great insights into their footprint that can help them make decisions. At best though, it's really forcing a company to think through the various ways and relationships that they have with where they operate, which is a, is, is a fundamental shift in how we think about companies' roles in society, really. In using the LEAP framework, we were able to get better data than we ever had before on our nature-related impacts and dependencies, and then use that to really think critically about what is Salesforce uniquely positioned to contribute towards this nature-positive future, right? We've used the framework to help think about, okay, within our direct operations, there's some really important things that we can do and work with our suppliers on, right? Especially around areas like water. But if we look at the full value chain and the full potential for influence that Salesforce has, that's why our pillar has three strategies. Of course, we are going to focus on reducing our nature-related impacts, but we also see huge opportunities. We don't see as many risks on this side of the spectrum, but we see huge opportunities to lead on restoration and help accelerate our customers. And we have some great data points now to back that up as well. Maybe not change, but at least reinforce that the direction we were moving in and the way we were evaluating things was correct um, and push our thinking too as well as we, as we saw where some of those locations we were operating in, um, what are the considerations that we should have. And I think for me also, doing the assessment helped to bring other stakeholders internally along. Um, when we said we were doing the assessment, we leaned on our climate team to leverage data that we'd used for our TCFD work, to leverage data that we already had for our annual carbon accounting. Um, so it wasn't a huge burden on those teams that were helping us, but it really did help accelerate us getting those actionable insights related to nature. We've been trying to help other organizations think about how to begin the journey. And we recently published a briefing that you were kind enough to be a kind of reader on pre-publication. And we called that Prepare to Leap. And it was about updates to the TNFD, 
and how to plan for the future. And it, it outlines five steps in total that I won't go through. It's kind of everything from building nature literacy to collaboration. But if we can get, again, a little bit of insight from the Salesforce experience, which of the starting steps has proven maybe more challenging? And, and how, did you, how did you overcome that? Just some hints for others who are starting up this work. So of the five steps, I think utilizing LEAP is probably the most quote unquote challenging, but I would say probably not challenging, but perceived as the most overwhelming Um, because it's the biggest and perhaps the newest to folks. Those things might be true. And it is also balanced by it being a very useful exercise. It then reinforces the work that we're doing in other areas. So I think what's more attainable and where we started at Salesforce was building folks' literacy in nature, right? There's, as I said before, we all agreed nature is inviting to people. It's a great antidote sometimes to carbon and what can be really uh, feel very far and removed from folks. Nature feels immediate and I think is offers some really interesting entry points for people And it also wasn't very hard to take stock of what we were already doing and identify what that low-hanging fruit was or areas where we already had programs or relationships. And that then helped us to think about the LEAP framework as a really helpful tool, bring those team members on board that were going to help us as contributors to the process. Um, So I see that as a really helpful feedback loop. I also think in terms of what comes next, what's, what's after LEAP, right? Now we have our a whole bunch of data points, as I said, related to risks, opportunities, impacts, and dependencies. That then opens the door for establishing governance controls within the company, which we already have a great track record on from the climate side of things and kind of a playbook. It allows for collaboration and figuring out what are those actions, there's no regrets actions, as folks call them, that can be taken today to contribute towards either halting or reversing nature loss. So I think there's plenty of great ways to get started. I hope others will take take this on as an exciting and very complementary addition or evolution of a sustainability strategy. I think that's how we're really seeing it at Salesforce. This is our sustainability strategy evolving to meet the needs and demands of tomorrow because you cannot separate climate and nature. They have to be thought of together. Well, an evolution and an expansion. I love the idea, actually, of finding your no regrets action um, or actions. I'm struck that I think, Julie, you effectively said, leap is great, but it's also really intimidating at the same time as nature is inviting. And Caitlin, earlier you said, leap is great. It's really practical. Oh, it's also incredibly complex. So it sounds like there might be some reason for people to have pause before they fully plunge in. But our briefing, Prepare to Leap, it really advocates the company start now, that they shouldn't wait on this. So can you give them an enticement or maybe there are risks to waiting that you see in the work that you've been doing, Caitlin, that you can express that will help folks grasp why it's essential, but also great to engage the nature and biodiversity agenda right away? Yes. And I think one of the overriding emotions that I'd love to see many corporates take away from the rise of nature agenda is actually relief that we're finally getting to the point where a lot of the jigsaw pieces are coming into place rather than see it as this massive overwhelming pressure to now comply with additional regulations and policies and follow a leap framework. At least from my perspective and a lot of businesses that we've been speaking to, there's been an underlying awareness that businesses are exposed to nature risks, but there hasn't been an ability to bring it to the boardroom, quantify it financially, plug it into scenario analysis to understand how does that evolve in under different climate environments. And we are definitely moving to that point where a lot of the pieces are falling into place. It's still going to be complex. That's inherent because one tree in one location means something completely different if that same tree was in a different location in a different socioeconomic context that's the nature of it and we have to accept it but we have got to a point where a lot of the foundations are there so from my perspective it's not so much like what are the risks of of waiting but why would you wait any further we're already in a strong place the risks are there 
And historically, they've just been hidden and silent and a bit invisible. We can now actually bring them into the risk management frameworks and start to ensure that business strategies are truly resilient. And there's been a lot of historical conversations around what does sustainability even mean? What does a resilient business journey mean? All of that is relatively redundant without this understanding of your interactions with nature. So the way I'm seeing it is we're taking it to a new level through the visibility that we're now able to get across how a business actually interacts with nature across its value chain. And then the other actual risk is each business is obviously not operating in isolation. Suppliers are asking more of vendors, buyers are asking more of their suppliers, customers, NGOs, governments. There's a lot of noise and it's not going to go away. And we saw that particularly with the RM team that went to COP15 last year, the advocacy and the calling out for mandatory disclosure on nature related risks was very, very enthusiastic. The next COP is a couple of years away. I strongly expect that the mandatory will become mandatory next time round. It didn't quite make it into the final wording this time round. And with that comes a whole set of regulatory risks that will come down on businesses, whether they like it or not. And preparing for that needs to start today, not only to ensure that you're preparing for the regulatory drivers, but also as businesses, they already are exposed to these risks. Um, just by by ignoring them is not going to make those risks go away. So I think the overriding emotion is actually gratitude for everyone in this space who has pulled together, pioneered, innovated to even help the whole global economy get to the point where we've got that clear sense of what's needed to keep moving forwards. Yeah, as new as all this is, I am amazed at present at how fast understanding and embrace of the nature agenda has really moved forward. And Salesforce has been pioneering, but happily, Julie, you're, you're not so alone already. And you can just see the number of companies and industries that are switching on to this whole question of impacts and dependencies. I'm struck how often I'll hear somebody comment on how massive or enormous society's dependence on nature is. And I'm kind of left with that question of it's not just big, it's we're entirely dependent on nature in so many ways. We do this very much for our own benefit, as well as for all the intrinsic value that nature brings us kind of back to the experience of the garden and to be being able to experience nature in all different ways in our own lives. Couldn't agree more with you, Mark. I also think we're not alone as Salesforce. I feel so fortunate, as Caitlin was saying, to have learned from all of the innovators and other companies that have come before us. And it doesn't matter if they're not technology companies, although there's some technology companies that are doing incredible things. But there's something to be learned from all of the different sectors that have started including nature as a decision within their businesses, but we can't get away from the fact that like we as society are just fundamentally dependent on nature functioning for so many reasons. And so if TNFD and the LEAP framework helps to open those boardroom doors and get on the agenda, great. If it's regulation that's helping you and your company, fantastic. If it's just a desire to contribute to your set of actions for climate, also great. There's plenty of different entry points into why companies should focus on nature. And I think you know, you'll know you enter in one door and then slowly, hopefully quickly, take on those other perspectives as well to make sure that this truly is being evaluated and managed in its entirety. So whatever the motivation, get going and expect to benefit from it. It sounds like it's really a positive reasoning all around. Caitlin, any last word from you? I think just going back to one of one of the drivers for why we're even addressing nature and why we're having this conversation is just the reality that without us, nature is going to continue to thrive. It's proven that it will do in many different situations, but without nature, we can't even survive. So I think that's, that's the reason why we're having these conversations. That's the reason why businesses are sitting up and sitting up quite quickly to want to know how to get started. So wow. leaving with that, that last message of, again, 
just get started. It's a journey. It's okay to not know everything. It's okay to be humble. And it's okay to learn from others. And when we talk about others, that's collaboration with your industry, beyond your industry, but critically with local populations and indigenous communities, local stakeholders who interact in the same areas that businesses interact. Because ultimately, it's only when we're addressing the issue of nature holistically, can we actually start to move forward with a plan that delivers for the whole of society beyond just business. Thanks so much, Julie and Caitlin, for joining us today. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks to everyone out there listening in our audience as well. If you're enjoying Sustainable Connections, please subscribe to the show on the platform of your choice. And we'd love any feedback that you might provide. If you want to learn more about how ERM is shaping a sustainable future, visit erm.com. Thanks so much and goodbye for now.